Okay, so uh, exponentials, logarithm, logarithms, and interest. So we will talk about exponential graphs, logarithmic graphs, and then interest. Um, so an exponential function is one that looks like this, y equals b to the x, where b is a positive real number, and the, ex, uh, the exponent, the x, is where our variable is, right? x to the n, like x to the seventh, that's a power function. We generally want our bases to be positive, because otherwise we get complex numbers, right? If b is minus 1, if our base is minus 1, then b to the 1 half equals i, we want to avoid that. So what do graphs of these functions look like? Well, there's the graph of 2 to the x. How do we get that? Well, we know 2 to the 0 equals 1, so we get 1 there. 2 to the 1 is 2. 2 squared, that's 4. 2 cubed is 8. Now, 2 to the minus 1, that's the same thing as 1 over 2 to the first power, so that's 1 half. 2 to the minus 2, that's the same thing as 1 over 2 squared, so that's 1 fourth. And if we plot that, there's 1, 0, 1, height of 2, 2, height of 4, 8, and then 1 half here, 1 fourth here. Notice that every time we increase x by 1, we double um, the output. Every time, right, so that is always doubling the output. So if x was minus 3, we'd be at 1 eighth, et cetera. So the domain, whatever positive, whatever number you have, you can use it as a power. So the domain is all reals. The range is only positive numbers. Because we sort of start at 1 and we start doubling or halving if we're going down negative numbers. And if you keep halving it, you always have, if you keep cutting it in half, then you always have a positive number. You're never actually going to get to a negative number. Special points, minus 1, 1, and 2. So minus 1, comma 1 half, 1, 0, and then 1, comma 2. And a horizontal asymptote, y equals 0, but that's only to the left. So sort of a typical exponential graph. So what do all of these graphs look like? Well, if you have a base that's bigger than 1, they all look pretty much the same. They all go through 0, 1. 2 to the x would look something like that. And that goes through 1. 2 and minus 1, 1 half. 4 to the x, 4 is bigger than 2, so it's actually going to be steeper, right? If x is 1, 4 to the x goes through the point 1, comma 4. And if f is x is minus 1, 4 to the minus 1 is 1 fourth, so it's actually lower down than, oops bad drawing, lower down than 2 to the x. So exponential graphs cross at 0, 1. The bigger the number, the faster it goes to infinity on the for positive numbers. And the bigger the base, the faster it drops down to 0 on the left. E is a number that's between 2 and 7. So its graph is going to be between the graphs of, well, E is between 2 and 4, 2 less than E less than 4. So the graph of e to the x will be between the graphs of 2 to the x and 4 to the x. So we can have fractional bases like b equals 1 half. And remember that 1 half to the x is related to the graph of 2 to the x. 1 half to the x, 1 half is 2 to the minus 1. And then 2 to the minus 1 is 2 to the minus x. So the graph of 2 to the minus x is a graph of y equals 2 to the x flipped over the y-axis. So if x is minus 3, this red graph is y equals 2 to the x. The blue graph is y equals 2 to the minus x, the reflections over the y-axis. So if x is minus 3, 2 to the minus 3 is 1 half to the minus 3 is 8. And minus 2, we get 4. Minus 1, we get 2. So 1 half 
to the minus 3 is 1 to the minus 3 over 2 to the minus 3. Negative sign means put them on other side of the fraction. And so that gives me 8 over 1, which is just 8. Anything to the 0 is just 1. So it goes to that point. And then 1 half to the 1 is 1 half. 1 half squared is 1 fourth. So it goes down to 0 on the right. So the domain is still all x. The range is still y greater than 0. Special points here now. Minus 1, 2, um, 1, 0, and 1 half, comma, huh, 1, comma, 1 half. Right? That's this point. And the horizontal asymptote is now y equals 0, but only to the right. So when we're graphing these three things, remember that 1 half to the um, right. one th uh, three to the minus x is the same thing as one third to the x, and e to the minus x is the same thing as one over e to the x. So one half to the x goes through zero one, and at minus one it'll have a height of two. 3 to the minus x goes through 0, 1, but at minus 1, it'll have a height of 3. When we get to the right, 1 half of x has 1x equals 1. It's at the point 1 half. And x equals 1, 3 to the minus x is at 1 third. So they cross over at 0, 1. Oh. That's something backwards there. So this should be one third. This is one half is up here. We cross over at x equals one. E is between two and three. So the graph of E to the minus x is between the graph of those two. Right? And as we learned earlier in the course, right, you can move graphs around by transformations. So five, what's this graph? So this is five to the x moved left, left, two units. That's the x plus two and down three. So how do we move graphs around? Well, we'll start with our basic graph. So this is y equals five to the x. What are the special points on this? And y equals one. This is at five. The point down here is zero, one. And at minus one, or height one fifth. And there's a horizontal asymptote is y equals zero out to the left. So y equals 5 to the x plus 2 minus, oops, minus 3. What's that going to be? Well, we'll start with this point, which is 1, 0. That's going to go left 2 units, uh, which is 0, 1. So we'll go left 2 units to minus 2, and then it will go down 3 units. But if we start at a height of 1 and go down 3 units, that means we end up at minus 2. So 0, 1 gets mapped over to there. The point 1, 5 goes to x is minus 1. That's 2 units. If we started 5 units up, we end up going down, subtracting 3 to that to 2. And then where does minus 1, 1 fifth go? Well, minus 1 minus 2 is minus 3. And then if we take 3 away from 1 fifth, we end up at well, minus three, but plus a fifth. So just above minus three. And then our wire horizontal asymptote is at y equals zero. Moving the horizontal asymptote left and right doesn't change where it is, right? We're only worried about moving it up and down. 
So the horizontal asymptote is moved down three units and becomes minus three. And so there's our graph, right? So the three special points you can use to sort of figure out where the center of the graph is and then the horizontal asymptote. So if we look at these four graphs, which one is which? Well, remember that four to the minus X, that's the same thing as Y equals one fourth to the X. So two to the X, 1.5, that has to be one of these two because these are bases that are bigger than one. You can tell which one is which because this one, when x equals one, goes through the point two. So that one has to be y equals two to the x. When x equals one, the height of the blue curve is 1.5, so that must be y equals 1.5 to the x. Right, one third and one fourth. We know that this curve when x is minus one will go through three, that's here. And when x is minus one, this would go through the point four. So this should be one fourth to the x. And this is one third to the x, this, that one. So there's our graph and how you can tell the, which ones are which. So a logarithmic graph, if we look at all these graphs that we've drawn for exponential functions, you'll notice they all pass the horizontal line test, right? And so that means they have inverse functions. And the inverse function to an exponential function is called a logarithm. And the notation for that is log base b of x. So we can graph logarithms. Remember that the graphs of an inverse function are flipped over the line y equals x. So if we put in a nice dashed line here, which is y equals x, this is our graph y equals 2 to the x. This is the graph of y equals log base 2 of x. Right? So that's our basis 2. So we just take the red graph, flip it over the line y equals x, and we get the green graph. What that means in particular is that if you take a point on the red graph, right, like the point one comma two, then if you flip it over there, you get a point on the um, logarithm graph, which would be the point two comma one. So zero comma one is here. on the exponential graph. So that means one comma zero is on the graph of this one. Likewise, two comma four is on the red graph. And so that means four comma two is on the inverse graph, which is switching the x and y's. And right at minus two, one fourth is on this graph. So, One fourth comma minus two is on that graph. So we've plotted all these points. What's the notation for this? For exponentials, right? The point two comma four, that's expressing the fact that two to the two is equal to four, right? X equals two, and we plug that in, we get four. As a logarithm, That point is four comma two, and that's telling me that the log base two of four, because here four is my x value, and the y value is two, right? Two to the zero equals one. That's my exponential value. If my function is log base two of x, that's telling me that log base two of one equals zero. So the logarithm, is another name for a power. Right? Zero is the logarithm base two of one, that's the power. This power two is logarithm base two of four. So we'll talk more about 
how to think about logarithms as we go through this section, but right now we're just introducing the notation. And the graph, here's the graph. What's our special log base two of x? Notice that our domain is zero comma, comma infinity. You can't take logarithms of negative numbers and the range is all y. Remember that the domain and range of exponential functions, ah, here we go. The domain is all x, but the range is y is greater than zero. For inverse functions, you flip that. The domain is x is bigger than zero. The range is all y. And I'll separate out that y so that it looks separate words. Special points. Well, log base 2 of 0 is equal to 1. Oh, God, it's backwards. Sorry about that. Log base 2 of 1 is equal to 0. That's this point. If I put in x equals 2, I get out y equals 1. So log base 2 of 2 equals 1. And if we put in 4, we get out 2. Log base 2 of 4 is equal to 2. And that's connected to the fact that 2 squared equals 4. Vertical asymptote is at x equals 0. We have this vertical asymptote here. It's the right side only. Unlike, horizontal, uh, unlike rational functions, right, our vertical asymptotes here only have one side. The exponential functions have a horizontal asymptote on one side, but not on the other. OK, so you can move graphs around the same way as we do other graphs. So. This graph is log base 3 of x um, moved right 2 units and up 5, right? Right 2 units, up 5 units. So log base 3 of x, what does that graph look like? Vertical asymptote. at x equals 0 on the right side only, goes through the point 1, 0. Let's see, 1, 2, 3. Goes through the point 3, 1. And then we have to go all the way out 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 to 3 squared to get up to 2. And if we went out to 27, we would be up to a power of 3. So there's the graph of our function. We want to move that right 2 units and up 5 units. OK. So the point 1, 0, if we take that right 2 units, that would take us to 3. And then up 5 would take us to 5, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's where this point would go. The point 3, 1, if we take that right two units, it ends up at 5. And then going up 5 would take it to 6. And 9, if we take that right 2, that would take me to 11. So 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 is way out here. And that would take me to y equals 7. And then my vertical asymptote, moving it up and down doesn't change the vertical asymptote because it goes all the way down. Moving it up five doesn't stop it from going all the way down. But we do want to move it right two units so that my vertical asymptote is actually going to be here going down on this side. And so our graph will come up at this point and that point and head off in that direction. So there's our logarithm graph moving around. So logarithms are a third type of function of restricted domains. So these are our rules, a complete set of rules for domains in our class. You can't divide by zero, right? Because you get vertical asymptotes, right? That's what happened in rational functions. Square roots, you can't have negative numbers in the square roots. And you can't have negative numbers or zeros inside a logarithm. And otherwise, if you're not dividing by zero, if you don't have roots and you don't have logarithms, the domain is all reals.
So what's the domain of this? Well, the vertical asymptotes are where the denominator equals zero. So this is domain is all x except x equals two and minus two, because that's the roots of the thing in the denominator. Here, if we have a root, we have to take whatever's inside and make it greater than or equal to zero. We can solve that. Add a seven to both sides, then divide by three. For this function, it's a polynomial, right? There's no division, there's no negative, there's no roots, there's no logarithms, so the domain is all reals. Here, we've got a logarithm. We want to know what the domain is. Well, x minus 2 has to be greater than 0 because anything inside the logarithm has to be positive. So that means x greater than 2. And that's the function that we just graphed up here. Notice that the domain here right, is only x's that are bigger than 2. What about x squared plus x minus 12? Well, this is where we get back to the quadratic inequalities. What's the domain of this? Where we need x squared plus x minus 12 to be strictly greater than 0. But we can factor that, x plus 4, x minus 3 to be strictly greater than zero. This is a parabola then with a x-intercept at three, an x-intercept at minus four, and it opens up. So where is this parabola bigger than zero? For x is less than minus four or bigger than three. And, and so that gives us that the domain of that graph is everything out here and everything out there. So one of the big reasons that we want to study exponential functions is to deal with interest. This is the compact compound interest formula. I'll explain a little bit where it comes from later. A is how much you have in the future. P is what's called the principal. That's how much you put in the bank. R is the annual interest rate um, as a decimal. We always want to represent this as a decimal. And then M is the number of times interest is compounded per year, and then T is the number of years. So keep in mind that this has to be years. Sometimes you'll see problems where it's given in months, you have to convert it back to years again. So here's an example. Jane puts $1,000 into an account that earns 6% annual interest compounded monthly. So that means every month, at the end of every month, they calculate the interest and they tack it onto the account. So 12 times a year. So how much in the account is zero? Half a year, two years, or in 30 months? Remember that 30 months is 2.5 years, right? We have to convert our time to years. So A is how much you have in the future. That's what we're trying to find out. $1,000 is how much we she is investing. The interest rate as a decimal is 0 0.06, and the number of times she compounds it, it's, the number of times the bank calculates interest a year is 12, because it's monthly. And then finally, the time, well, we have three different times, one half year, two years, or 2.5 years. So you just plug everything into the formula and see what you get, right? So for a half a year, A equals P, which is 1,000, times... 1 plus 0 0.06 over 12, right? 12 times a year times raised to the power of 12 times and t is 1 half. So we have to be careful about our order of operations. 0 0.06 divided by 12 is 0 0.005 and 12 times 1 half is 6. Remember, we have to do the exponential before we multiply by the 1,000, uh, 1.005 times 6 is about 1 point. So this number is 
um, 03 something, something, something. Right, if you calculate that. And so finally, how much money did she have? A thousand times 1.03 is going to be 1030.30. There should be a zero there and then more of that. So she's gained about $30 in about half a year in interest. So in two years, 1,001 plus 0 0.06 over 12 times 12 times 2. That becomes 1,000, 1.005 raised to the 24th power. So we take 1,000, 1.005 raised to the 25, 24th power and multiply it by 1,000. And we get 1127. Point one five nine three something something something. Um, so how much does she have in the bank after two years? One one two seven point one five because banks rate round down, right? The point one five nine three. They're not going to give you that extra point oh oh nine uh, cents. They'll just round it down to. 15. And then same thing for 0 0.06 over 24, 12 times 2.5. How much does she have in the bank after 2.5 years? That turns out to be about 161.4 dot, dot, dot. So it's pretty straightforward using this formula. Um, again, where does this formula come from? So compound interest works by taking what you have, multiplying by the interest rate as decimal, and adding it to what you have. So if you have $120 in the bank and they compound your money by 10%, how much do you have in the bank after the compounding? Well, you start with $120, the interest is 10% of that, and 10% of 120 means take 0 0.10 and multiply it by 120, this is by 10%, and that's gonna be 12. So the bank gives me $12 in interest, so at the end I have $132. And I got that by adding these two together. So where did my $132 come from? I added 120, plus 12, but where did the 12 come from? That came from multiplying 10% times the 120. And now I can factor out that 120, right? So factor out a 120, I factor out, leave a one here and then a 0.1. Or what I'm doing here is I'm just taking 120 and multiplying by 1.1. So every time I compound 10%, that means I'm just multiplying the amount of money in the account by 1.1. So if you start with $120 in the bank, after one compounding, you have 132, which is what we figured out above. After the second compounding, How much money do you have? <clears throat> well, they take the $132 that you have, and they take 10% of it, and they add that on. So that's 132 plus 13.20. So you end up with 145.20. So but let's be clear about where that came from. The 145.20 is 132 plus 0 0.10 times 132. And as we saw above, that means we just take 132 and we multiply by 1.1. Well, where did the 132 come from? That was 120 times 1.1.
So where did this 145.20 come from? We took the initial amount, which is 120. We multiplied it 1.1 quantity squared because we have two compounding periods. So after third compounding, you would have 120 times 1.1 cubed. Um, which I think is 159.72. So after three compounding, you have that. So the compound interest formula comes out of this because R over M is the interest per period. So if you get 6% compounded monthly, that means they take the 6% and they divide it by 12 and they apply that at the end of each month. So that's what the 0.05 was up here. The 0 0.06 over 12, the 0 0.05, that's how much you get interest per month. The M times T, is the, um, and this is often called I, M times T is the number of periods, compounding periods that you have. And that's also called N. So you also see this written as that. And that's exactly this formula that we have here. One plus the interest rate per period raised to the number of compounding periods. So what about the number E? If the compounding rate gets bigger and bigger, how much more interest do you get? The more often you compound the interest, um, the more money you get. So suppose we have a dollar at 100% interest. You can tell this is a math problem because it's completely un unrealistic. So how often do you want your um, interest to be compounded? So if you do every year, that means it's one compounding period per year. After one year, you'll have $2. Semi-annually, that would be twice a year, and you actually get $2.25. So why are these two different? Annually means at the end of one year, they calculate your interest, and they give you 100% on $1. So at the end of one year, you have $1. That was how much you put in, plus $1 in interest. That's your $2. Semi-annually, what that means is that they take 100% and divide it by two, because it's twice a year. So they give 50% interest after six months. And you put in a dollar. So that means at the end of the... June, you have a dollar fifty because you put in a dollar and then they give you fifty percent interest. That's a dollar fifty that you have, and then they give you another fifty percent interest at the end of December. But fifty percent of one fifty, well, that's seventy five cents, and so you get two point two five. So you actually get an extra quarter by compounding twice. You compound four times. You get an extra almost 20 cents. 12 times, you get almost uh, 17 cents, 2.61. Um, and it keeps going up. What you actually can find is as you compound more and more often, the amount of money you end up in your account starts approaching a particular limit. And that limit is actually the letter E, that um, the number E that we have used above when we we're sketching our graphs. It's about 2.71888. And so if you're compounding all the time, you take the limit as the number of compounding periods goes to infinity, you end up with that as your formula. And that's sort of the best you can do for any given interest rate. So Ben Franklin invests a cent in 1750 at 4% interest compounded continuously. How much is that worth in 2023? Well, all of these formulas 
have a bunch of different oops that's not what i wanted a bunch of different letters so you have to remember what they are and so we can write them down there which one is which a is the amount of future p is principal that's how much you invested annual interest rate and this is in a decimal and t is the number of years so here we're investing 0 0.01 because it's one cent, which is a hundredth of a dollar. Four percent interest, so interest rate is 0.4. We're interested in how much it's worth in the future and how much time are we giving it? Well, 250, 273 years. So one penny invested at 4% interest in 1750 is worth how much? So 0 0.01 times E to the 273 times 0.04. There should be an E button on your calculator and that will help you calculate or, or E to the X and that'll help you calculate these sorts of things. Remember you have to do the exponential before you do the multiplication. And if you multiply that out, um, it turns out to be $522.70. So if he actually invests a little bit more than a penny, um, he would have a huge amount of money at this point. And so that's our continuously compounded interest formula. So how long? That's a question that always comes in finance. How long will it take my money to double? How long will it take my money to rise to this amount? So imagine Jane needs $600 to buy a bicycle, but she only has $400. And if the bank gives her 6% compounded continuously, how long would it take her money to grow to $600, right? And so here's a graph of her account. You can go to Georgia Brown and graph it. Um, this is time in years. Oh, where's my thing? There we go. And this Y is amount. So here's our function. Time is in the exponent, so it's an exponential function. And the graph looks like this. Ah, sorry, 400. So t equals zero, it's got $400, and then it increases like that over 10 years. OK, so can we estimate? Well, this is what the um, intermediate value theorem does. We can look at this. We want to know about $600. Right. So this is kind of an inverse function, right? We have $600 in the amount. We want to know what's the time. We can estimate this. If $600 is the account. That means we're looking for this point. And that's definitely between t equals 6 and t equals 7. So if we put in 6 and 7 into this function and calculate it, after 6 years, she has $573.33. In seven years, she has $608.78, right? So one of these numbers is less than 600. The other is bigger than 600. So sometime between six and seven years, her bank account went between, her bank account hit $600. And we can narrow that down a little bit. 6.7 years would be 597.492. 6.8 years is 601.52. So somewhere between 6.7 and 6.8 years, um, her bank account went from below 600 to above 600. So somewhere in between here has to be our time T. And we can throw in, go out to two decimals, 6.75 is 599.72. And 676 is 600.08. So T, the time should be start with 6.75 and then have a lot of decimal points after that. So this is about six years and nine months. Because 0.75 is three fourths, three fourths of a year is nine months. 
So how can we actually tell what this is? Um, well, we can use a logarithm. Right. If our function is, if we want to solve the equation 600 equals 400 e to the sorry, 0 0.06 t, we can isolate the exponential part, divide both sides by 400. That means we have 3 halves equals e to the 0 0.06 t. If I think about this in terms of the exponential function, that's telling me that the point, point 0.06 t, where t is our unknown number, 3 halves, is on the graph of y equals e to the x. Right? Because if you plug in 0.06 t for x and 3 halves for y, you get this equation. But if we flip that, 3 halves 0.06t is on the graph of the inverse function log base e of x. And now the 3 halves is being my x, and the 0.06t is being my y, or 0.06t equals log base e of 3 halves. And this is a number that your calculator can calculate. Ln is a shorthand for log base e. Ln stands for uh, logarithm natural. My French pronunciation is terrible but it means natural logarithm in French, so ln. But you can calculate that, and your calculator will tell you that logarithm, natural logarithm of 3 halves is about 0. 0.4054, dot, dot, dot. And so t then, the time that we're looking for, how long does it take our money to go from 400 to 600? Just divide both sides by 0. 0.06. And that gives you 6.757518, dot, 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 depending on how many digits you want to include. So 6.75 something, which is what we found by using the intermediate value theorem. So in terms of interest, exponential functions say, if you know what the time is, I can tell you how much interest you have. Logarithm, I can tell you how much money you have. Logarithmic functions say, if you want to know how much money you have, I can tell you when that would take place. So logarithms answer in terms of finance, how long will it take for my money to increase to a certain amount? And so that's our introduction. We'll talk much more about logarithms and exponentials in the coming weeks.